An ordinary car dealership in Boston hides a terrible secret buried beneath years of development. But let's dig up the past and see what horrors are hidden beneath. He gets nine, so that picks up seven pins and puts him up to a 26 pin lead. Saturday mornings, families all around Boston would tune into Channel 5 to watch Candlepin Bowling, filmed at Sammy White's Brighton Bowl. The show was extremely popular, and the local filming location made it feel like it was part of the community, which made it all the more shocking when the bodies of four men were found brutally murdered in the back of the bowling alley one morning. Sammy White was a popular catcher for the Boston Red Sox, who after his retirement opened a few bowling alleys around the Boston area. He went on to become a professional bowler himself in his retirement years. Let's go out to Fenway Park and I'll take you through the story of the massacre at Sammy White's Brighton Bowl. So here at Fenway Park, I'll tell you a little bit about Sammy White. As I said before, he was a popular catcher for the Red Sox from 1951 until 1959. In 1953, he made the All-Star team and at the time was the only player to score three runs in a single inning. He did this against the Detroit Tigers when the Red Sox scored a record 17 runs in that single inning. White was also featured in the Norman Rockwell painting, The Rookie, while he was on the team. Although Fenway Park has changed a lot, many of the features were still the same in the years that Sammy White played there. We see the world famous Sitco sign over Kenmore Square as we leave Fenway Park and head down Commonwealth Avenue into Brighton to talk about the murders. On the morning of September 22, 1980, an employee arrived for work at the bowling alley and he noticed a safe open and called police. He said it was fairly obvious that something was wrong and not likely that the safe was left open accidentally. When police arrived, they searched the building, more than likely thinking they were investigating a break-in or possibly a robbery. When they searched the mechanical room that housed the pin resetting equipment, however, everything changed when they discovered the horrific scene. The bodies of four men were scattered in the room. Blood was reportedly everywhere. Each man had their hands bound behind their backs and their brutalized bodies made it difficult for first responders to see that they had also been shot. Near the bodies, a bowling pin covered in blood was on the floor. This was later determined to have been used by the killer to bludgeon the men before they were killed. To what I'm sure was their surprise, one of the victims was discovered to still be alive. He was rushed to nearby St. Elizabeth Hospital, but did not survive. Some reports had it that he died on the way to the hospital. Others said that he made it to the hospital and then died. Either way, the one chance the police had at an eyewitness was gone. The victims were identified quickly and were all employees of the bowling alley. They were 40-year-old George Hagelstein, 41-year-old Donald Deroni, 21-year-old David Cobe, and his brother, 23-year-old Brian. Brian was the one that was still breathing when police arrived. Approximately $4,800, a little less than $17,000 in today's value, was found to be missing from the safe, which led the police to determine robbery was more than likely the primary motive. It was assumed that the killer beat the victims with the bowling pin and tortured them in order to get them to open the safe. Even though at least one of them complied and the safe was obviously open, the killer still shot each one of the men. The well-known location of the crime, as well as the brutality involved, put public pressure on the police to solve this quickly.
Not long into the investigation, the police focused on 41-year-old Brian Dyer, who was living in Somerville, a city just next to Boston. He was working as a cab driver at the time of the crime, but had previously worked at Sammy White's in 1973. It was reported, but not confirmed, that he had gone to Sammy White's in the days before the murders in an attempt to get his job back. Dyer was a large, muscular man who was known as shaky due to a possible nervous disorder, though one Brighton resident was quoted as saying, you didn't call him shaky to his face. Those who knew him, including a neighbor of mine, described him as strange or weird. It was also said that he was quiet and kept mostly to himself, but yet another report said he was known as a practical joker. So it seems maybe no one knew the real Brian Dyer, and I'm sure no one could have predicted that he would have committed such a violent murder of four people. Some of the evidence against Dyer was a sudden influx of cash that he used to pay off debts and buy a new car. This was a man that was usually known to be struggling financially, and there was no explanation for his sudden newfound wealth. He was also reportedly a heavily indebted gambler, giving him a reason to need this much cash. Because of the amount of press coverage and the media's description of the brutality of the crime, a move was made to reinstate the death penalty in Massachusetts. It passed in the legislature and was signed into law by Governor King in 1984. The state Supreme Court, however, overturned it and ruled it unconstitutional later that same year. It is not known if Dyer would have been eligible in the timeline had the law not been overturned. Dyer was eventually sentenced to four consecutive life sentences for the murders. The judge mentioned the savagery of the crime, reminding the public that the victims were handcuffed or otherwise restrained before being beaten with the bowling pin and then shot. Dyer died in prison in 2011. The bowling alley was closed in 1986, and not long after, it was torn down and a car dealership was built in the location. That car dealership is still there today, as Acura of Boston. We'll be pulling up on that now, and although the building and the location have changed, what had happened there in 1980 can still be felt if you dig deep enough. Sammy White went on to open other bowling alleys in the Boston area, but they all eventually closed as well. The neighborhood of Brighton has changed too. The colleges continue to grow, forcing hardworking families from their home and making it all but impossible to afford to live there. I'm Holty with Holty Stories. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you next week. On Camelton Bowling. Hi, everybody. Welcome once again to Candlepin Bowling. I'm Don Gillis, and you all know by now that this program is on videotape. We do our taping here at Sammy White's Brighton Bowl, sometimes several weeks before you actually see the telecast. It's always three strings of Candlepin Bowling, total pinfall determining our winner. That winner is rewarded with a handsome marble base.